security research without getting sucked into a courtroom. So, thank you very much. I'm used to walking around and talking, so I'm going to try to remember to stay behind the microphone. So if I, thank you, this will come in very handy. So if I stray too far, try to center me back here. Uh, my name is Robert. This is Take It From An Attorney. How does security research without getting sucked into a courtroom? I got my start with computers after I got out of the Marines many years ago. Um, I found that I knew enough about computers so I could start doing desktop support. So I did that for a while, moved up into systems administration, moved into systems engineering before I decided to go back and actually study what I really wanted to do when I was a kid, and that was be an attorney. So I was working full time, went to law school full time. Uh, fast forward to today, I am a licensed attorney, member of the California State Bar, the United States District Court Bar that sits in downtown Los Angeles. I am a member of the American Bar Association and a cooperating attorney with the EFF. Um, a lot of uh, cases and clients that I do uh, help on come from the EFF. So, I've established Roblox. It's my own law firm. We specialize in information security, um, computer law, data and privacy law, and cyber law. As much as I hate the term cyber, that's what the state bar calls us, is cyber law. So I specialize in cyber law. Um, so who does this talk really pertain to? It pertains to anyone who's ever asked the question, what happens if I do this? Or how secure is that really? So if you've ever asked those questions and you've tried to answer them for yourselves, then this talk is what's gonna to pertain to you. Uh, and the goal for the talk really is to, one, make you aware that you are playing a game. Whether you realize it or admit it, you're playing the game. So I'm trying to educate you on what the rules are for the game that you are playing. Then you can decide for yourself where that line is and how much risk you want to take and how close to that line you become. Um, so what type of attorney would I be if I didn't have disclaimers? Um, so this presentation is for uh, informational purposes only and is not to be a substitute for legal advice. The information in here as it relates to the laws of the U.S. are current as of today's date. So if you're fortunate enough where you're watching this at some point in time in the future, know that laws change, the way courts interpret laws change, so it's only accurate as of today. If you have a specific legal question, make sure you seek the advice of an attorney who can answer your specific concern. Attendance in this presentation does not constitute an attorney-client relationship, and there is no privilege between you and me. I'm going to try to give you four years of law school in 40 to 50 minutes. So that's a lot of information. I will try to make time for questions. I can't guarantee that there will be. If not, I will be around afterwards and tomorrow. Come find me. I can talk about this stuff until you're sick of hearing from me. A um, couple of things to keep in mind about questions. If you do ask them, one, make sure your questions are generic. Remember, this is an open forum. And two, if your questions start with the phrase, I've got a friend, I'm going to stop you right there. I don't do I have a friend questions. Either one, admit that it's you, or two, go get your friend, bring them to me, and let them ask the questions directly. Uh, legal advice is best given one-to-one -one and not through a third party. So with that, let's get started. So I'm going to take you through some basic fundamentals of what I call Law School 101. Sorry, is this better? All right. Sorry, I did tell you that I do like to move around, so I'll try to be still. So the first point that I want to make is that we don't have a justice system in the United States. We have a legal system. Justice system implies that it is fair. It's not fair. When you walk into court, it's not about what's fair. It's about what I can prove. And more importantly, what I can disprove from the opponent's side. So we don't have a justice system. We have a legal system. That, subs or that system is broken up into two subsystems, which for the most part act pretty independently of each other. There's not much crossover. One is the criminal system, and the other is the civil system. 
Now, the criminal system is a charge against the state and really asks the question of, are you guilty? And if so, what's your punishment? And the civil system is really a complaint between two people that you can't resolve, so you're going into court and you're gonna let the judge decide for you. It asks the question of if the defendant is liable, and if so, how much money does it take to make the plaintiff whole? In the course of this, we're gonna talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is 18 United States Code Section 1030. We're gonna talk about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is 17 United States Code Section 1201. We'll also touch on the Copyright Act, trade secrets, and if there's enough time, we'll talk about company policies as they relate to terms of service, terms of use, acceptable use policies, and how all of that can be used against security researchers. So let's jump right into the wonderful piece of legislation that's the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I agree, it is, it is not a wonderful piece of legislation. In Section A1, starts off by saying it's unauthorized access against the computer of the United States. That can be any United States government, agency, department, it doesn't matter. What this is really targeting is espionage against the United States. It's unauthorized. So as security researchers, what's the best way to protect yourselves from this? Don't target a computer used by the United States government. Unless you've got a very specific and well-worded and sign multiple time contract to do some type of testing, don't target a computer against the United States. Now, A2 is a little bit different. It starts off intentionally access as a computer without authorization, or you exceed your access, and thereby you obtain information from a bunch of different places. So it does start off as intentionally. And intentionally means that you know what you're doing. You knew or should have known and yet you still continued to do it. It's an intentional act. You don't accidentally violate section A2. But notice for A1, there is no intentionally component to it. You can accidentally target a computer of the United States and violate A1. You can accidentally be charged with A1. You can't for A2. A2 requires that intentional act. It also requires that you obtain information. Now, the wonderful people who wrote this legislation defined a lot of terms. Information, however, isn't one that they defined. It's a pretty vague term. Um, so what is information, really? There's a debate between uh, lawyers, um, between data versus information. And data is, usually uh, what's considered in raw format, whereas information is considered data that's been analyzed into uh, useful information that humans can consume. And the debate is where along that spectrum data becomes information, where it would violate this one. Um, so if you take the example, let's say, um, sending a ping request to a system. You send that ping request, you get a response back, that response is probably not information the way that congressmen intended it to be, right? It's just a reply back to your pain. But if you copied a file, whether that's a DLL, um, an XML file, a database file, readme.txt, any of those files, that's probably closer to what they mean by obtaining information. And then lastly, we've got this little phrase protected computer. Now fortunately here they actually define protected computer for us. It is any computer of a financial institution or United States government. Okay, so it's the same two as what's above it. They're just repeating themselves. Or any computer used in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce or communication. So let that sink in for a second. That's a massive definition. So if I have a company in California and I'm selling widgets and you happen to live in any other state besides California, it could be Arizona, 
it could be Florida, it doesn't matter. Any other state. You hear about my widgets, you go to my website, you buy a widget, I ship it to you. Every system that's in that order process could be considered in the use and affecting interstate commerce. Then when you think about our global economy, almost every computer is affecting interstate or foreign commerce. And I think you'd actually be hard pressed to find a system that isn't affecting interstate or foreign commerce or communication. That's a very big definition. So who is A2 really targeting? It's really targeting those people who are trying to download and steal um, protected or personally identifiable information, PII, or espionage again against the United States. That's really who it's targeting. So as security researchers, how do you protect yourselves from violating A2? Well, the good news is it's got a loophole. You, one, have to intentionally access a computer, but you also have to obtain information. So if you're just doing security research to see how vulnerable something is, you shouldn't be copying data off of a system. As long as you're not copying that data off of a system, then you're not violating A2. Easiest way to avoid violating this, don't obtain information. So we move on to the next two sections, and these are sections that actually probably pertain more to security researchers. So we've got A5A is knowingly causes the transmission of code and intentionally causes damage. So we start with knowingly, which is very similar to the word intentionally. You knew or should have known what you were doing. This isn't an accident. You didn't just stumble across it. You knew what you were doing, and yet you still did it. But knowing what? You knowingly caused the transmission, and then that's intentionally causing damage. So this is malware. You wrote something that you know is going to transmit itself, and then that transmission is going to intentionally cause damage. So this is malware. So as a security researcher, you shouldn't be doing malware. But remember, we have a legal system, not a justice system. So it's not fair. So if you were charged with violating A5A and you walk into court, you can't just simply say, well, I didn't intend to cause damage. It doesn't work that way. The prosecution will have the opportunity of presenting evidence that says you did intend to do it. Then it becomes a question of fact for the jury in who they decide. It's the downside of having a legal system as opposed to a justice system. It's not about being fair. Now we get to A5C. And this is the one that I call the fuck you clause for security researchers. This is the one that's going to trip up a lot of people. So it starts with intentionally. So we're off to a good start. You have to do something, and you have to know what you're doing. It's an intentional act, right? But intentionally to do what? I've heard from a lot of my clients that they assume that this means that they're intentionally causing damage and loss, very similar to the one above it. But that is an incorrect assumption. This one isn't about intentionally causing damage or loss. This one is about intentionally accessing. And it's that access that causes damage and loss. This one, you only have to intend to access a system. And for whatever reason, it's that access that causes the damage and loss. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation that we're going to talk about as we go through these slides. Let's say you have an IoT device that communicates to its manufacturer and transmits its serial number. And you're curious what type of information you can get back about other systems if you're able to spoof that serial number. So what you do is you write a script that enumerates all possible combinations of serial numbers, transmits them to the server, and see what type of response you get. That's an intentional access. It doesn't matter what the outcome 
that you wanted from that. It's the simple fact that you intended to run that script. So let's say while your script is running, it generates the serial number 111111 that for whatever reason, when the server receives that, it crashes the server. It didn't matter that you intended or didn't intend to crash that server. The simple fact that you accessed it and that access then caused the server to crash is a violation of A5C. So let's talk about what damage and loss means. Damage is any impairment to the integrity or availability of data, systems, programs, or information. And loss is any reasonable cost to a victim, any revenue lost, cost incurred, or other consequential damages incurred. For consequential damages, there's two types. There's compensatory damages and there's consequential damages. So think of a car accident. Someone rear-ends you on the freeway. They have to pay to fix your car. They have to compensate you for causing the damage to your car. That is compensatory damages. But there's a lot more that it costs you in a car accident. There's time off of work. There's filing police reports, tow trucks, rental cars. All that other stuff besides the actual fixing of the car, those are consequential damages. And that's what they're looking for here. You've reached out and accessed their system. You've caused their system to crash. And now they have to clean up your mess that you created by accessing their system. All of those are consequential damages. So this could be labor costs to rebuild the server. This could be labor costs to replace the server. The fees that they have to pay to retrieve backup tapes to restore their server. All of that could be considered consequential damages. And it's the little things that make the big difference here to security researchers. For instance, whether their systems are hosted in the cloud or on-premise makes a difference. If they're hosted in the cloud, presumably they're probably paying per transaction, per traffic, per cycles. So if you're sending a million requests, that's going to jack up their cost. That's going to cost them more. That's a cost incurred. That could violate A5C. Whereas if they're hosted on premise, where presumably they're paying a flat fee for internet access, then maybe that million transactions doesn't quite have the same effect. So all these little nuances start adding up and start making a, a difference when determining whether or not you're violating one of these statutes or not. So as security researchers, how do you protect yourselves from A5C? Well, you can start taking notes, using best practices in your code, actually put comments in your code. And I know that sounds a little silly because it's almost like you're sort of documenting your crime, but we'll see where that will come back to help you later on. The other thing that you can do is when you're writing your script, build it with a throttle. Limit or cap how many accesses you're doing over a period of a minute or an hour or a day. If you're working with a popular manufacturer whose website has a million hits and you're only sending a couple of thousand, you're probably going to go unnoticed. Whereas if you're dealing with a site that only has a couple hundred hits and you're sending thousands of requests, you'll probably show up very quickly on the radar. So a lot of that makes a big difference. The other thing to keep in mind is that you can also, when you're um, doing your throttling, you can limit it, obviously, but doing your recon in your research so you know all of this information. So for instance, knowing where their servers are hosted, knowing what their pricing structure is, all those little things can come back to help you. Um, most of that information should be public information, so it should be something that you should be able to find. Um, you don't want to get to the point where you're stalking and committing a crime to avoid committing a crime. That's not a situation that you want to be in. Then I want to move on to A7. So let's say you found a vulnerability and now you're trying to disclose that vulnerability. You should never, ever, ever, ever ask for money, ever. 
if they offer, it's okay to accept it. If they have a bug bounty program, it's okay to remind them. If they say they're gonna give you some money, it's okay to remind them. You just can't be the first ones to ask for it. Even if you do everything else right under the CFAA, you can be still charged with a violation just by simply asking for money. It's considered extortion or blackmail. And lastly, under criminal law is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So no person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work. So think of this as like the Adobe software where you have to type in a license key to get the software to work. That's what this is. Anything that you do that tries to get around something to make it work, that's gonna violate the DMCA. So you can attack it head on, you just cannot try to circumvent it. This is really applied to security researchers through authentication handshakes, code signing, and uh, protocol encryptions. All those are considered protected works and are protected under the DMCA. So while we're on the subject, I do quickly want to go through what to do if you are arrested in that situation. Number one is don't resist and don't fight. Once an officer has determined that you're under arrest, arguing with him is not going to make him change his mind. It's only going to make it worse. There's never been an officer that I know of that has said you're under arrest and is like, oh, you know what, you make a good point. You know what, never mind, you're free to go. That doesn't happen. Once you're under arrest, you're under arrest. Do not attempt to escape or elude. Escaping is its own charge. So even if you're later acquitted or the charges are dismissed, they will still hold you for the simple fact that you escaped. Comply with all of their instructions. And there are some people who will tell you, you know what, I'm in the right, the officer's in the wrong, so I am not gonna comply with their instructions. And I tell those people, think of the pedestrian that always says that I have the right of way when they're crossing in the crosswalk. And legally they are true. When they're in the crosswalk, they have the right of way. So they're just gonna walk right out in traffic and they're gonna say the car's gonna stop. And I'm like, but in that situation, car beats pedestrian every time. The real winning in that situation is not getting hit by the car. And the same thing applies here. In that situation, cop beats civilian every time. The winning in that situation is surviving the ordeal. Be polite, but do not consent to any questioning or searching. Make mental notes of where, when, and if your rights are read to you. You can provide your name, address, and date of birth, but don't answer any other questions. You should always request your attorney, and questioning should stop after you ask for your attorney. And if they trick you into asking questions, and they very well may try to trick you, stop talking and ask for your attorney. Even as something as simple as, how's your leg doing? And you say, it's fine, it's just a little scratch. And they're like, oh, the suspect that we were looking for was seen running and fell down. Now you just admitted to having an injury consistent with the suspect they're looking for. Simple little questions make a difference. So stop talking and ask for your attorney. And that is pretty much all that we have for the criminal system. So now we're going to move into the civil system. This is when a security researcher tries to talk to you and try to sue you for something. And we're back to the wonderful Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This is section G. So here's all the different things that they can do or that you have done that they can sue you for. And what are they really trying to get out of you? Well, they're trying to get either compensatory damages or injunctive relief. And compensatory damages is what we talked about earlier, right? This is you fixing whatever you broke. And injunctive relief is an order from the court that's telling you to either do something or to not do something. And typically courts like to issue orders that are in the negative as opposed to the affirmative. They like to stop you from doing something as opposed to telling you to do something. There was a famous case a few years ago about a celebrity um, whose name I won't mention. 
she had a contract with a specific venue to perform a concert on a specific day. And she got a better offer from another venue to perform on that same day. So she called the original venue and said, I'm going to breach the contract. I'm not going to perform there. I'm performing this other venue. And the venue owner, rightfully upset, goes into court, tries to get an injunction requiring her to perform. And the judge said, no, we're not going to do that. It's too many questions of how well you're performing. Did you perform the same way as if you were there? Courts don't want to do that. They don't want to get messed or get messed up in that. But what the judge said is, we're going to say that you can't perform anywhere else on that day except that venue. So then you get to decide, do you want to perform that day and get paid, or do you not want to perform anywhere and don't get paid? And what ended up happening is the singer, out of spite, was like, you know what? I'm just not going to perform that day, and went unpaid for the day. Um, so that's injunctive relief. So how do security research protect yourselves from getting sued under Section G? There's a couple of things that are built into the statute itself to help. One is a two-year statute of limitations. They have two years from the date of discovery to sue you. And that's date of discovery, not date of access, an important thing to note. And second is this curious little clause at the end of it that says, no action may be brought under this subsection for the negligent design of hardware, software, or firmware. This is where keeping your notes earlier that I talked about and doing your comments in the code can come into play. If your software did something that you didn't intend it to do and your comments show otherwise, then maybe you were just negligent. And that could save you if the jury believes you. So injunctive relief. We talked about what it is, and typically in the context of security researchers, what this is, is they're trying to stop you. They're trying to stop you from publishing your findings, or they're trying to stop you from talking about your findings. And I will admit this is where I'm going to get on my little soapbox for a minute, because I have a pet peeve about this. Your, essentially what they're trying to do is stop you from exercising your First Amendment right. But there's something missing from this. So the First Amendment, free speech, free press, free exercise of religion, free assembly, but there's something that's missing that most people seem to think is in there that's really not. So it says, Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peacefully to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. But what's missing? What does it not say? It's the freedom of consequences. You are free to say whatever you want to, but you are not free from the consequences from that speech. So Sarah Palin was in the news a few years ago. Um, if, you, if you've watched the show Duck Dynasty, one of the people on the show, he um, made these homophobic comments, and the producers of the Discovery Channel removed him from the show, and this really irritated Sarah Palin, and she went all over the news saying, how dare they abridge his freedom of speech? He can say whatever he wants to. And that's true. In fact, he actually did say exactly what he wanted to. The very reason she was arguing was because he exercised his rights. He said what he wanted to but he wasn't free from the consequences of his speech. And this also applies to security researchers. You are free to say whatever you want to say, to publish whatever you want to say, but you are not free from the consequences of doing so. Especially if it relates to public safety and welfare. Now, the Supreme Court has held that prior restraints do violate the First Amendment. That's the Near v. Minnesota case from 1931. And a prior restraint is a court order preventing you from speaking before you even have the chance to speak. They call those prior restraints. The court affirmed that in 1971 and created a couple of minor exceptions with the New York Times v. United States case, more popularly known as the Pentagon Papers case, involving the New York Times and the Washington Post. They created a couple of minor exceptions, bless you, for things like national security, incitement of violence, 
ongoing court cases, and then anything that's considered illegal. So if your talk or your publication is about something that could be illegal under the CFAA, the court could very well rightly block you from doing it, and that would not be a violation of your First Amendment rights. Now, the balance to you being able to say whatever you want to means that the manufacturer can sue you for defamation. And this is why I say you are free to make your speech, but you are not free from the consequences of your speech. Now, the defense to defamation is always the truth. And by truth, I mean a statement of the facts. So let's say you're walking down Hollywood Boulevard, night out in the town, and you see a woman that you think is a prostitute. So you take a picture and you post it to Twitter, because I guess that's what people do nowadays. The school district happens um, to see this picture. It turns out the lady is not a prostitute. She's a teacher. And they fire her. She can sue you for defamation. Because when you posted it, you added the caption, here's a hooker on the street. Now, if you had just said, here is a woman walking down Hollywood Boulevard, that is a simple statement. Sorry. That is a simple statement of facts. Statement of facts. You're not responsible for the way someone else interprets what you say. You're just responsible for what you say. So when I mean a statement of facts, I mean when you're preparing your talk or you're writing your publication, stick to the facts. This is what you did. This is what happened. Provide evidence that supports this is what happened. Don't editorialize. Don't add your opinion. Don't make assumptions. Because when you do that, all of that can be used against you should the manufacturer decide to sue you for defamation. Screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. everything. Best evidence. The more evidence you have in your paper, the less they can sue you, because then it is more of a statement of facts. Absolutely. I do quickly want to talk about the Copyright Act. You can be sued for this as well. So during your speech or during your uh, writing of your uh, publication, you can't use any of their proprietary code. It's copyrighted. Doing so would be a copyright violation, and they could very well sue you for that, just like they could sue you for downloading their movie. Then we've got trade secrets, and this is proprietary information that's generally not known to the public, but has some unique value to the company. So think of Coca-Cola and their secret recipe for Coke. If you were able to somehow obtain that recipe and post it online, amongst many other things, they could also sue you for violating trade secrets. Sometimes manufacturers like to make the argument that their vulnerabilities are features and are thus trade secrets. So be careful with that. And lastly, we've got company policies. So these are terms of service, terms of use, acceptable use policies that they can use against you. But here, they're not suing you. All they're doing is banning you from their systems. Now, they do have to ban you. So you do sort of get that free, one-time, built-in warning. They ban you, then you can't go back. Going back is almost a guaranteed violation of the CFAA. Because you knew what you were doing, you knew you were banned, and yet you still continued to do it. It goes back to intentional. You knew what you were doing, and yet you still did it. So once they ban you, find a new manufacturer, new something, and move on. You are to never go back to that manufacturer. So with that, I will open it up to questions. And I know that you had your hand up a couple of times, so I'll start with you first. Then I'll move to you. So if they have that, that could be... That intentionally causes damage. Yes. So 
so if they're releasing code that are transmitting code, so they can't just release it on DVD or CD or something. They have to knowingly transmit it and that it intentionally causes damage. And if they were to do that, then yes, they would be violating it just like a security researcher would no, or an attacker would. No, for example, Microsoft updates the internal crash the You would have to prove, one, that they knowingly transmit it and that they intentionally intended to crash your system. And I think that would be a very hard burden for you to meet in court. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Where does uh, interaction with the device, let's say, uh, It depends on what you do with it. So it probably wouldn't be under the DMCA. I can see the argument that it would come out under trade secrets. Um, if when you talked about what you discovered by doing that, if you leaked any um, information about how they programmed it, they could make that argument. And that sort of went back to what I was saying earlier, where they like to disguise vulnerabilities as features and then say that they are trade secrets and that they're protected. Feature. Right. So they could sue you for that. Granted, again, it's a legal system on a justice system, so they have to prove all of that. But assuming that they could prove it, you, you would be liable for it. Yes, sir. very long time, so to sum it all up for you, I actually recommend you not doing responsible disclosure to yourself at all. I recommend going through an attorney and letting the attorney make the disclosure for you. And in that process, then you would have all those same agreements, pretty much of what you just described. But should they choose to not um, agree to those terms, if they want to sort of dig their, hand in the, or their head in the sand and pretend like they don't there, or they want to go after the manufacturer or the um, security researcher and try to stop you from speaking, you can hide behind your attorney a lot easier. Because if you're my client, I can't necessarily disclose your identity at all. So all they're doing is going through me. And that information may or may not make it back to you. Does that answer your question? And, and if you want more of it, we can talk about it again later. Yes, sir. At that point, can the attorney ask for money? Yes, all that does become billable hours, yes. So what they would do, so if they really wanted to pursue the issue, they, they, they would take the issue to court. Your attorney would go in and say that is uh, privileged information. I am not releasing that information. The court can then either decide that they have a case or they don't. But what it does is it forces the courts to say, you know what, we can't just listen to one side of it. We have to bring the attorney in, so it gives your attorney the opportunity of arguing on your behalf before the court can shut you down. And that's the biggest advantage to hiding behind an attorney, is they can't just do something outside of court. Any other questions? Let me get to them and then I'll get back to you since you've already asked. Yes, sir. My, my biggest thought on it is when you take out those insurance policies, make sure you find out what is not covered. Um, a lot of insurance companies like to put in certain requirements, and if you don't meet those requirements, they're not going to pay out should something happen. The biggest requirement that they like to put in there is that you must be 100% patched. So if they find out that you are missing one patch in your system, they can make the argument your entire situation is not covered. So make sure you know exactly what your liability is under that policy and what's excluded from coverage. Yes, sir. So 
there's a lot that, that goes into that. And this was meant to be more of a high level talk about things that can keep you out of court that could normally put you into court. So there's lots of things that you can do with anything that you own. You can practically do anything you want to with it. So there are lots of exclusions that I did not cover. And that was intentional because I wanted to get through the stuff to try to keep you out of court that could normally put you in there. So if you want to talk about things like that, come see me afterwards and we can talk about them. Let me get to him and then I'll get back to you. Yes, sir. So it does work both ways, because it doesn't say uh, who has to initiate. It says that you can't sue for, for uh, negligence of uh, hardware, software, and firmware. So it does absolutely work both ways. It's just most of the time, individuals aren't suing the manufacturers. But it does work both ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right, and it does, yeah, it, it does work both ways. Yes, sir. So I have a spread. Nope, <laughs> stopping you right there. Yes, sir, your question. Well, I, I was just kind of thinking about something. One of the things that kind of keeps coming up when we talk about CFAA and some of these other things, what is the responsibility of essentially the, the organization who gets back? So this comes up with OPM, this comes up with Equifax. And it's like in, in both cases of those, like there have been very high level disclosures that have just come from sure incompetence. And to the point, what at what level did they become liable for not even pretending to due diligence? So that's actually a very good question. It's a question that needs to be answered and it's a question that hasn't answered yet. It is in the process of being answered now there's been many class action lawsuits uh, filed specifically against Equifax because of their big breach last year. And it will take probably a couple of years for all of those to work through the courts. What I see happening is they are held to what's called a negligence standard, which means they have a duty to provide care. They breached that care and that breach caused the damage. That's what I see happening. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean you're gonna get a lot of money out of it, because then that means you have to prove you were actually ha uh, harmed. Um, there is legislation pending that tries to do away with that actual harm requirement. The mere fact that your data was stolen is enough, um, but it has not passed yet. Yes, sir. It could. Um, so there's a couple of things to your question. One is with access and what actually access means. Um, and sending a ping and getting a response back is probably considered an access, right? But what if they block uh, ICMP traffic and you send a ping and you don't get a reply? Is that a response or is, is that an access? And that's an, an open question. There isn't really a good answer to that. Um, if you get a shell on a machine, that probably is considered an access. If you're doing a port scan and you're getting and you use the word information back, that could go to A2 because you've accessed intentionally and you've obtained information. So clever argument that could actually be a, a violation of A2, absolutely. So I have hit the end of my time. So I thank you all very much for your attendance. If you have any other questions, if I didn't get to any of your questions, please come feel free to see me. I will be around today and tomorrow. I thank you very much.